two on by half. Here we go. Oh, oh, here's the block. Look at that. Look at that. Fire. Yeah. Manning stays on his feet. It is caught by Tom Brady. Watford three on the way. Oh, oh blocked by James. Pass is intercepted. Drives down. That's broken down. Down. down for the championship. Oh, yes. We will see you tomorrow night. This is for the win. This is Chris Canary of the Indiana Pacers on Fox Sports Indiana, and you're listening to Small Town Sports Talk. Hello and welcome to another episode of Small Town Sports Talk brought to you by Endeavor Communications. It's been, what, two weeks, I think? Basically, I guess since since the start of the tournament, we had our uh, March Madness preview, but I'm Jonah Freeman, joined as always by my co-host, Andrew Willett. Andrew, how's it going, man? On Jonah, it's going pretty good, but a lot has happened since that that point, and a lot of uh, bracketology was busted. And I, I'll tell you what, my, mine certainly was busted pretty quick. But we did, we got to see a national championship last night. Baylor, of course, coming out on top over Gonzaga. Uh, but yeah, Jonah, doing pretty well. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, first off, I. I want to definitely, I mean, the point of this episode is the March Madness recap. So I want to talk about the whole term a little bit, but fresh off the game, what are your thoughts about what took place last night? I I was honestly uh, crazy surprised by just Baylor was a lot more physical. They were more, they had more intensity. They were, they were just dominant compared to an undefeated Gonzaga team. I was just stunned by that, and props to Baylor. They're the champs. Jonah, what did you think so, Like immediately after that championship? Oh, man. It was – I it was like – I told my – and I texted you this last night. I told my dad, like, yesterday morning before the game started, I was like – I personally, and you know this, I, I was big on this. I thought <laughs> that Gonzaga and Baylor would end up seeing each other in championship as two undefeated teams. And then Baylor had COVID, and that slowed them down a little bit. So they, and then some people thought, are they really that good? Well, newsflash, they are. They're they're pretty freaking good. Uh, But I mean, they were both so good throughout the regular season. I told my dad, I was like, if one team starts off sluggish, it could be a blowout because of how good the other team is capable of being. And that's what we saw. Suggs picked up two fouls early. They couldn't hit anything. It was like 9 0, I think, at one point. And I mean, against a Baylor team that played the way they did last night, you can't get down 9-0 early. Well, so. what was trending, Jonah, was Baylor's defense. Like, they were at every spot for Gonzaga, and their pressure just slowed down that offense. Yeah, I think people who watch Baylor throughout the, the regular season know, but the people that just tuned in last night, I think Davion Mitchell solidified himself as one of the best two-way guards entering the draft. What he did with Suggs when Suggs was on the floor – he beat everyone in spots. He forced turnovers. He had Nimhard looking like he did not want to be on the floor. Nimhard was turning the ball over left and right. It was just the, the defense, not just from Mitchell, like you mentioned. I mean, it helps. I, it was everywhere, and that's why Gonzaga struggled getting into a real rhythm enough to get them back in the game, and that's why you saw Baylor winning by 16 points in the national championship. And, John, I wanted to ask you that because like Gonzaga's been your team all year long. You said, hey. I, you don't think they're going to lose a game here. And uh, obviously, n- nearly got it right. Uh, but how, how did that feel? And, yeah, what, what went wrong for Gonzaga besides that sluggish start? I really think it was just a sluggish start. I mean, I I had a little bit of a – I don't know if I'd call it an argument. But <laughs> obviously, Gonzaga did not play their best. But with that being said, they still scored 70 points. And, I mean, like they didn't play a terrible game. I saw people on Twitter complaining about like just too many turnovers. And when you look at it, they only had one more turnover than their season average. And it was right around the NCAA average for the season. So it's not like Gonzaga just uncharacteristically turned the ball over. They shot 50% from the floor. I mean, it was just, I mean, seriously, it was that slow start that really, you, you just cannot get out of a hole whenever Baylor's playing like that. So whenever they get in that hole early, I mean, I was surprised they found themselves in that hole, but once they were in that hole, I was not surprised they couldn't get out of it. Now, how does Gonzaga uh, go through and not 
You're right. They really didn't play too bad. I know like the first half shot 50% from the floor and had a bid deficit at one point. So how does Gonzaga, like how do they not face a challenge like this through their first 30, so, 30 or so games until they get to this point? Well, I think I saw some talk just, to, I mean, obviously you look at their conference, they're, they're not, they were not challenged at all on their conference. And I, you definitely have to talk about that. But I mean, part of it was they were playing so freaking good to start the year. They, I mean, they, they killed Iowa. They killed Virginia. They played four or five top 10, top 15 teams and literally killed them all. Like teams that you would not expect 25 point victories over. They were still winning by 25 points. So, I mean, seriously, I think they were just clicking so well at the beginning of the year. They just rolled through everyone. And then, I mean, I wasn't surprised at all. They rolled through their conference and then at times were rolled through the NCAA tournament until they saw Baylor. So I think, yeah. I, I think Mark few is a good enough coach. I, I expected them to handle adversity if it came their way, but they just hadn't really had much of it up until that point. And I think it kind of found them looking for answers a little bit more than they would have liked to. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to point out that their tournament opponents, it was Norfolk state, Oklahoma, Creighton, USC, and that gets them to the final four where they take on an 11 seed. Obviously, UCLA uh, had a phenomenal tournament, really turned it on late, but not really a whole lot of challenges until you get to this point for Gonzaga. And Baylor, like I said, more physical. It, every time I thought uh, Gonzaga was going to turn up the urgency and play with a little bit more intensity, Baylor, like, they didn't stop playing with that intensity. They, were, they had it all the way throughout. Some of their shooters, man. Like, yeah, I think uh, Butler really put the game away to start the second half because Gonzaga. I overall thought Gonzaga played an all right game, but the way Baylor played in the first half for Gonzaga to kind of go on that run at the end and find themselves only down ten, I think they had to be feeling pretty fortunate. And they got it down to nine at one point, and then Butler hit a three. They came down the floor. He caught it about midway between half court and the three-point line, took a quick release three and knocked it down. And just like that was back to 16. And I feel like from uh -huh. that point forward, there, like there was – you cannot come back from that. Because well, every bit of momentum you went for, it's, it's gone. Since I had that little 8-0 run to get it down to 10 heading into the break. And then also uh, Suds had his and one with all the fiery emotion that led to nothing – yeah, I thought if that if there was a time, I thought that might have been it. The way Suggs was really getting emotional, but I mean, and even if you looked after that, Jonah, they still had 16 minutes to try yeah. and put something together, and nothing. I think the bottom line is when you look at, I still believe Gonzaga is one of the better teams to ever play. I mean, but there is not a team I think ever that would compete with Baylor when Baylor is playing like that, when they're playing defense like that and knocking down shots at that rate, I don't know how you stop that at all. <laughs> so I, I just, when you get yourself in that hole early, I don't think you, you can be surprised really by the total outcome with the way Baylor played and kept their, kept their composure throughout that game. They, they took the punches and they responded with their own. Yeah. Baylor, uh, just an all around uh, team. And I, I don't know why people really, didn't believe in them. I didn't really believe in them back when we uh, filmed. It, it was because they were coming off COVID and they weren't they weren't as solid as they were to start the year. But T Mitchell Butler, like you said, uh, I I have one more quick question for you, Jonah. Before we kind of talk about the whole tourney, how, how many NBA guys did we have out there on the floor last night? Quite a few. Uh, Timmy, Timmy's going to be an NBA guy. Kisper's going to be an NBA. Suggs is obviously an NBA guy. Davion Mitchell's an NBA guy. Butler's an NBA guy. I don't know about Masio Teague. I would assume he is. And then, I don't, uh, I don't. yeah, and I don't know. I think physically he's got a spot in today's NBA with maybe some of that small ball. Um, I, as as good as every single guy I just talked about is, you heard throughout a lot of watching the Big Twelve that. Meyer was probably their biggest prospect on the floor who comes in and gets you 20, 25 points off the bench on almost a nightly basis. So, I mean, the, I'd say there were probably at least four guys on the floor at all times that are going to be NBA guys and potentially lottery picks. So 
I mean, I don't, it, it was a game that I think we were, we're pretty, I wish it would have gone a little closer, but I think we were fortunate to see it because when it got canceled in December, I think a lot of people were hoping that we would see it. I, I had that in my bracket, Gonzaga versus Baylor. Obviously, I've talked about it a lot. I had Gonzaga, which didn't happen, but uh, I'm excited. I'm, I'm happy we got to see that, and I am happy for Baylor because one of the two teams was going to get their first title in program history, which was pretty cool. Jonah, do you know what is ridiculously fast? What's that, Andrew? Endeavor Communications Internet Speeds. That's right. In Indiana, basketball is everything. And if you're anything like Andrew and I, you are always streaming basketball, your favorite sports, or just your favorite shows. And hey, you're always going to need Wi-Fi. Ridiculously fast. Endeavor Communications provides Wi-Fi perfect for watching the big game, streaming your favorite shows, working, studying, and gaming all at the same time. Not only is Endeavor fast, but when you go with Endeavor, you support the whole community. Endeavor Communications is proud to serve and support our local community from homes, education, businesses, Endeavor will keep you ahead of the game. You can find out more and see for yourself at weendeavor.com. That's weendeavor.com. And tell them Small Town Sports Talk sent you. Yeah, Baylor, like you said, first in program history. It's crowned the 2021 COVID National Champions. We made it all the way through. You talked about it, though, Gonzaga. You had them. It didn't quite go your way. Let's talk about a few others in this tournament that kind of just had us shaking our heads. Uh, what, what was maybe one of those first early round upsets that you got right, Jonah? Uh, Ooh, just that I got right. I'd say probably the, the biggest one was the Ohio or Virginia. And I think a lot of people had that. I mean, I, I had a, like the eight, nine, I, I had a couple of those. Um, I had a couple upsets that I didn't have go my maybe, way. Yeah. Maybe one that you didn't get. I felt extremely confident that Winthrop would beat Villanova and it was <laughs> Villanova came out with some athletes and it. yeah. So um, I think the biggest shock for me, not even, obviously I didn't have this predicted. I think the biggest storyline to talk about from this tournament is probably Oral Roberts mm-hmm. knocking off an Ohio state team no, that was playing know. some of their best basketball and then knocking off Florida and then probably an inch away, just barely missed a game-winning three to potentially put a spot in the Elite Eight. Uh, I mean, it was it was crazy to watch, and it was cool to watch. I mean, that is that is why it's called March Madness is because of storylines like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Oral Roberts, without a doubt, screwed a lot of people's brackets. Luckily, I didn't have Ohio State going too far. The, the one in that same region, though, uh, your Purdue Boilermakers certainly uh, – Laid an age on my bracket. Um, Aiden yeah. states right there as the Boilermakers. I had them in a Final Four team, as I told you all on this podcast uh, at the start of this. Just completely blew it. Lost in overtime. North Texas able to get that win. Texas also uh, going yes. back to them. Abilene Christian knocking yeah. them off. That was not. I did not expect that one at all. And I think Syracuse is another run to kind of talk about their yeah, Sweet 16. Like every just, other year, you're going to have to throw them in your Sweet 16. Yeah, it just seems four. like Beheim is always finding ways to win in the tournament, which is crazy because they were one of the teams that a lot of people complained got a spot over a team like Louisville at, at, the, at the March Madness Selection Show. So Syracuse was a team that a lot of people thought shouldn't have been in and made a run, which ha- seems to happen a lot for them. So um, – and then – I'd say a lot of people had Illinois as their national champion. So for sister Jean and the Ramblers to play the defense, they did and knock off Illinois. That was definitely a storyline, but I think at the same time, there were a lot of people that kind of felt and that had watched Loyola all year that like, they are not your typical A seed. And And they absolutely shouldn't have been. Yeah. And so I, like I personally, I had Illinois winning that game, but at the same time, I expected it to be close because I know Loyal is a solid team. I did not see a 13 point victory for Loyal, even if Loyal would have won. But I mean, Crutwig, <laughs> I mean, Loyal played uh, good. I and I was, tournament. yeah, I was, I was really surprised to then see after as well as Loyal played against Illinois, then to get knocked off by Oregon State for sure. <laughs> And getting into the second round, yeah, I I had Illinois as my champion. I that was the one seed I really really believed in. 
And th- this is where I, I really did upset Jonah is Loyola Chicago. They're, they're going to go all the way out here. They're going to take down the one seed, lose very next round. Like, you, can't, yeah. you can't go do that. It was the same thing. I had Virginia win it at all a couple of years ago. And then some little school, UMBC, don't even know the know what that school is. And they go out and drop them and lose the very next round. I, right. That, that gets me. But the second round upset that I had right really went my way. I also had UCLA in this uh, first round. But second round, uh, Oregon taking down yeah. Iowa. I saw that one coming. Uh, I had Iowa getting uh, probably – I thought Iowa would just get pounded again by Gonzaga like earlier in the year. But, I mean, whenever some of these other players aren't stepping up, we saw it in some of the Big Ten play. Like Garza is a beast, and he's always going to be a beast. But if Garza's putting up 35 and the rest of the team can't produce, it doesn't matter. You can't win a game with 35 points. And you saw – Oregon and Duarte, like they scored the ball and they had four or five guys that were doing it compared to Iowa's one that can consistently do it. So um, I I was not really surprised that Oregon won that game, but I definitely saw Iowa winning that game. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I like the Ducks and they, they really looked for real before they. Yeah. And then I think another one just saying in the staying in the same state, uh, Oregon State. Like, that was a, a run that nobody saw coming. Yeah, the Pac-12 kind of ran this tournament, it seems. <laughs> yes, they did. I know Walton is really happy about that. And uh, <laughs> sticking with the Pac-12, I think we definitely, if we didn't talk about the run that UCLA made, I think we'd be doing something seriously Service. wrong on this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so UCLA, the 11 seed, I mean, you have storylines all the time in March Madness. It's March Madness, but... Michigan State had that team on the ropes in the first four. They had the damn one in regulation. And then we see UCLA make a final four run. Like That was sweet (sighs) to watch. And uh, I'm happy for Mick Cronin. I think Cronin's a guy that didn't get – he doesn't get looked at a lot, and he was probably the sixth or seventh guy that was on UCLA's list whenever they wanted to go a different direction from Alford. But – he did a tremendous job this year getting Juzang to go there. And probably I think everyone could agree for the most part, Juzang was probably the tournament MVP this year. I mean, he, when they needed a bucket, he went and got it. And I think that was a big part of UCLA's success, but it was really cool to watch UCLA do what they did. Yeah. You looked at that, that final four UCLA and Gonzaga, it felt like a uh, really a, David and Goliath type matchup, but the matchup was one of the better games we've seen in college basketball. Yeah, I mean UCLA. Uh, we we were with each other watching that game. UCLA put together a the perfect first half, and Gonzaga was still up, still found a way to be up. And I, I kind of thought to myself, okay, they've they've taken all the punches they can, and now it's Gonzaga's turn to really take it over. And then Gonzaga found themselves in a position where they easily could have lost that game. Until big plays, uh, Timmy took a really big charge, and then obviously the shot everyone knows, Suggs knocked down the buzzer beater after Juzang was able to tie that one up. Man, Joe, I know I just have to say about that one, uh, like that, what a terrible way to lose a game if you're UCLA. Just a huge faint shot. That's that's rough. Uh, But then on the other side, a lot of Butler fans wish they would have had that go their way ten ten or so years ago. And I'm oh. sure the rest of the nation does too, is taking down a, a Duke. That really would have been a David Goliath type moment. Um, but on the other side, Houston, Kelvin Sampson leading the crew in Indiana, getting all the way to the final four. Yeah. I think the, the I think the, the last thing I'll say on ba- Baylor's behalf, and that's, and it's kind of going to be a comment towards Houston. Houston was a really good team that didn't get talked about all year. And I think I was so excited and so blinded by the fact that Gonzaga was chasing literal greatness that I just, I totally dismissed the fact that Baylor absolutely put it on Houston. And that's so, I mean, I saw it happen, but I was just like, especially after the sug shot, I thought, okay, it's destiny. Gonzaga, Gonzaga's taking this. They're, they're going to go undefeated. They're going to run the table. I, I just, I didn't see that Baylor team coming and they proved me wrong, but they did it. The, that's the craziest part about it is Baylor 
didn't just play like that in the championship game. They did it in the final four. They put two perfect, perfect games together, sure. which obviously is deserving of a national title. Absolutely. And you, you talked about that, that history and wa- wanting to see that come to fruition. It just felt like that, that Suds shot. Uh, like not only did I not like it for UCLA and just, I, I, did, I just didn't like the ending, although it was one of the best shots ever. I felt like it was uh, one game too early for Gonzaga. Yeah. They, they yeah. needed that, that challenge, that effort, that storybook ending in that championship game in Indianapolis to be the first team since Indiana. Well, and I really feel that because of the lack of close games in the tournament, I feel like if Gonzaga could have kept it close, that would have really helped them out. But they just couldn't get it close. Baylor was just that good all night last night. Mm-hmm. So – I mean, it is what it is. It's, it makes me sad. I really want to see Gonzaga do it, but it's <laughs> it is what it is. And you got to see some of these tournament games. How was it just uh, in Indiana, the whole thing? Shout out to Indianapolis for real. Yeah. The one cancellation, and even then it sounds like the, the reason it happened was because of something outside before they even arrived. Um, I just – I'm glad that Indy got this attention because people that have been here for the Super Bowls and – I mean, we've had Final Fours here before. Like, they know, like, what kind of a host city Indy is. But then to literally put all this in the hands of Indianapolis and say, all right, you're going to have to form a bubble. You're going to have to make practice courts. You're going to have to – I mean, all of that. And they did it almost flawlessly. Like, hmm. we we just played a whole NCAA tournament without really any hiccups. So it was cool. And then allowing fans obviously to be able to do that. It was neat. I, that was going to be my senior gift before COVID hit was I was going to go to this year's final four. And then it just kind of ended up working out even better that the whole tournament was going to be here with fans. So I ended up going to four or five games, which was cool. Uh, Unfortunately I was at that Purdue game. You talked about that was not really a good time, but I enjoyed it. It was, it was neat to be an indie. It's when it's cool walking downtown and looking up and seeing the world's largest bracket, on the side of the JW Marriott, I think that's just like Indy is, is a really good spot for that. And I'm glad that they got the attention they deserved. And you, you talked about that Purdue dam. Usually I would absolutely love to rub that in your face as not being a huge Purdue guy, but I, I wasn't too happy about that either. But yeah, Indianapolis did a great job. The Indiana the state did a great job hosting this whole tournament. It's crazy that they got that to logistically work out and there's talks that they could even do it in the future. Yeah. I think I would like to see Indy get a not, I understand not the whole tournament because I think it's cool that you have sites and eventually, like eventually Gonzaga would be the number one seed. They would have probably had home court for some of that. They would have given them a region that fit them best, stuff like that. But and this is no shade to Dayton. It would be really cool for Indy to get some kind of like a permanent piece of March Madness. Just the history of basketball in the state. The NCAA headquarters are literally downtown. I just think it'd be cool maybe if they always hosted the first round, always like something like that I feel like would really benefit just like everyone involved with March Madness. Yeah, great city for it. And uh, obviously worked out very well as Baylor – Crowned the national champion of March Madness 2021. Jonah, any closing thoughts on this March Madness that we just went through? I'm excited for next year. <laughs> I'm ready for next year. Let's Favorite time of the year. Got four TVs going the first two days all the time. It's it's fun. It's just a oh, great yeah. time. I'll say it till the end. Those first couple days of the tournament, best, best couple days. It's like – I'd say even the the Sweet 16, you like towards the end of the day, you always have your, you probably have two or three games going at once. But there is like literally no better feeling than getting to sit at home and know that you have four great college basketball games going from noon to midnight. Like that, it's just so fun for two days straight of that. And then again, like I just mentioned, then you have the Sweet 16 where it's just great game after great game with a couple going on at the same time at the end. So, uh, Man, I'm, I'm excited again for next year. Congrats to Baylor, though. For real, that was quite a run. 
happy to have the tournament back. And hey, we've got a few more cool episodes coming up for you uh, in the next couple of weeks. So make sure to keep listening to Small Town Sports Talk wherever you listen to podcasts, whether that be Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, and more. For Jonah Freeman, I'm Andrew Willett. This is our March Madness Recap. That's ST Squared.